So my name is Paul Morrow. I am a board member at the Peace Museum, and I teach in the Human Rights Center at the University of Dayton. Uh, for those joining us in person and for those viewing this digitally, I want to say welcome to the Peace Museum. We're about a month into our new space, and I'm giving the first of the Peace Builders lecture series to be held in the new space. Uh, if you're familiar with this series, you've been watching it over Zoom, I think, for the last several months. Um, I want to thank Jacob Bauer, who's one of the co-directors of that series, for inviting me to give this talk about the world's first Peace Museum. And I have a lot of images to show because what do you want to see about a museum? You don't want to hear me say a lot of things about it. You want to see what was it like? What did it have? How is it different from this museum? How are some of the concerns of the people who created that museum similar to ours today? And how are they different? So if you were here for the ribbon cutting about a month ago, I, I teased this talk and I said, this museum opened 120 years ago across the Atlantic Ocean. It existed for exactly 18 years, and we just hit our 18th birthday with the Dayton International Peace Museum. I hope that we will hit many more iterations of 18 as we go forward. So I'm gonna tell you basically three kinds of things about this museum. First, who are the founders of the museum? How did it get started? Um, why was it started? This is a sort of era between the international abolition movement and the more familiar peace movements of the 20th century, the civil rights movement that you see here on the walls of the museum today. You may not know as much about the sort of organized European and North American peace movements of this era, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. I'm gonna talk about the amazing founder of this museum who is not well known here in the United States, but I have friends in Poland who say, yeah, he's one of our national heroes, and it's too bad that he's not better known outside of Poland. Then I'm going to talk about what was in the museum, how is it different from this museum, I have lots of images to show there. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the fate of the museum, both the sort of fate of the physical objects and the fate of the ideas that it was organized around. When I'm done, can't do this digitally, I think, um, there are some objects associated with the museum with its founder on a table behind you, so I'll be very happy to sort of introduce you to those, including a guidebook, a program for the museum, and some of the publications of the founder. So let me get into it. Um, this is the founder. This is a portrait bust created of him that existed in the museum. He's a man named Jan Bloch, alternatively Ivan Bloch, alternatively Jean de Bloch, alternatively Johann von Bloch, <laughs> alternatively Ivan Bliok. And you know, you see immediately there's a challenge in making him better known and just researching in him because he published in many different languages quite intentionally. He published things in English, in French, and in German, because those were the sort of big international languages of Europe at the time. But he was born in Russian-controlled Poland in the first third, or right after the first third of the 19th century. And so his native language would have actually been Russian, though he also would have known Polish. And so he wrote many things in Russian as well, which are not as well known today because I cannot command all those language facilities, and there are very few who can. So you'll see these are some of the different ways his names are spelled. You'll see different versions of this. I'm going to call him Jan Bloch here. And I'm going to say, I'm going to tell you, why did this person who was born near Warsaw in Poland, why did he end up founding a peace museum in Lucerne, Switzerland, towards the end of his life? So here's a map of the part of Poland. Poland was partitioned in starting in 1795 and continuing through the 19th century. So there was a part that belonged to the Austro-Hungarian Empire. There was a part that belonged to Prussia, later to Germany. And there's a part that belongs to the Russian Empire. He was born in the Russian Empire-controlled part of Poland. He was born into a Jewish family near Warsaw. This is the town he was born in. It's called Radom. I'm sorry for the um, level of clarity of these names here. Uh, it's not terribly far. This was a town where if you were Jewish up until I think 1814, so up until the Napoleonic era, you couldn't live in that town. Um, so there were restrictions, but there was a significant Jewish community sort of around this town. And it was a sort of manufacturing town. His parents were themselves textile manufacturers. Um, his grandfather had lived in Prussia for a while and then came back to this part of Poland. And they had fallen on hard times because at this time, there were, as I'll show in the next slide, um, you didn't enjoy civil or political rights. So there were a lot of uh, things that you couldn't do. You couldn't export products, for example, if you were a Jewish manufacturer in this part of Poland at this time. So he leaves this town of Radom. He goes to St. Petersburg. 
when he's about 15 or 16 years old, he converts. And there's some controversy in the historical record. Did he convert to Calvinism and then later convert to Catholicism? Did he just convert to Catholicism? It's not quite clear, but he converts, um, which is very common for Jews living in this part of Poland at this time. Um, that secured his business interests. It made possible to participate in a lot of different civic endeavors. So he became the sort of person you would go to if he said, hey, Warsaw, which was the town he eventually settled in, you know, needs a new sewage system or needs new homes for the poor or needs a new high school. He was involved in all of these kinds of projects throughout his life. There's an important historical event that um, I am not an expert in, but there's an event called the January Uprising where Polish nationalists are trying to throw off the Russian imperial rule in 1863. And it was a time when people basically had to choose sides. Well, Bloch, maybe as part of the um, anticipation of his future work in peace, he didn't want to choose sides. He didn't want to join the nationalists. And he also didn't want to join the Russians who were sort of putting down this rebellion. So he leaves Poland. He goes to Berlin. He studies finance, accounting, statistics in Berlin. And this is, again, a period of his life where there's not a particularly big archival record. So it's a little bit hard to know how long was he there. His family by marriage was involved in this revolt. And so there's a sort of turning of the tables. His, I guess, uncle-in-law, Cronenberg, was one of the wealthiest men in Poland at this time and very involved in banking and also in railroad construction. And after this moment, because Cronenberg uh, sort of loses some of his ability to participate because of his involvement in this revolt, uh, his son, his nephew-in-law sort of helps him recuperate his political standing, but also becomes a big rival. And one of my favorite facts, and I have not been able to find a cover of this, Bloch was the subject of not one, but two smear novels that people commissioned <laughs> about him. His uncle-in-law was one of them. And so his uncle commissioned a Polish novelist of the time to write a book called Honest Work and Botch Jobs. And the sort of villain of that piece is Bloch himself. That was just the first of his two smear novels. So he settles in Warsaw. He becomes a sort of civic icon in Warsaw. And part of what he's doing is very local, but part of what he's doing is international. I showed you that map. He's building the railroad lines that connect Warsaw, on the one hand, to St. Petersburg, the imperial capital of Russia. On the other hand, there's a town that our, our intern, Andy, he spent time in Latvia. There's a town on the coast of the Baltic Sea in Latvia that was sort of a a port that didn't freeze over in winter, so it was very important for the Russian Empire to have this sort of uh, all year round naval access. So he built a line that connected Warsaw going west to that town as well. And he was a, the sort of person, which you may know in your life, who's just constantly has a million irons in the fire, right? So he's doing all this work. At the same time, he's founding a statistical bureau in Warsaw because he thinks, well, we need data to be able to do the financial work and to be able to do the railroad work. So he hires statisticians and he uses them to write these multi-volume treatises on the finances of the Russian empire, on the railroad system of the Russian empire. There's a wonderful quote by one of his English biographers. It says, he built his books like he built his railroads, which means he had a big crew of people working for him, drawing together facts, writing texts, putting together things. And that's gonna be important for the book that is most closely associated with the Peace Museum that he founded. This is, these are images, and I had to use sort of Google Translate to get the details about them, but this is a chart showing government spending in the Russian Empire, 1850 to 1852. You're gonna see some much more interesting graphics in his work on peace, but he was already interested in how do I show sort of statistical information in a way that conveys things to my reader differently from sort of text in my books. There's another book that is sort of well known in his biography, but unfortunately does not survive in any known copies, which he wrote in order to try to disprove the claim that pogroms in Russia at this time were sort of caused by sort of peasants' natural response to uh, exploitation by Jewish landowners. This is a sort of anti-Semitic trope of that era. And so he says, well, how do I disprove that? Well, I could just sort of go out and say that's not true, but maybe I could go and look at the data on standards of living, on agricultural yields. If there's exploitation, those should both be lower. In fact, those are both much higher in the areas where the landowners happen to be ethnically Jewish. So that was an attempt to disprove that. And he actually prevented some legislation that would have been anti-Semitic in its effects from being passed because he was able to show this at this time. 
But again, unfortunately, that text is not available. I'm sure that would be one that would be translated today if it was. And so I suppose it was because of this combination of interest. So interest in what maybe today we would call sort of positive peace. How do people live together in harmony in sort of multi-ethnic, multi-religious societies? And this sort of statistical interest that leads to the thing that got me interested in him in the first place, which is I read there's this Russian person, Russian Polish person, who wrote a six volume book about why peace is necessary in the late 19th century. And so I'm an academic. I was like, six volumes on peace? I want to find that book. I want to read that book, right? So I started looking into Bloch. You know, this is the book. This is the German translation of the book. Uh, the title in the original Russian was The War of the Future in its Economic, Technical, and Political Aspects. The German one is just called Der Krieg. So just war, basically. <laughs> and he got, he'd started doing this in part because of those conflicts of interest. But he was asked by businessmen in Warsaw, like, how would we defend this city in case there's a siege, right? Given the kind of modern weaponry that would be brought to bear. The Franco-Prussian War, where Paris is put under siege, is 1870 to 1871. So this is still sort of familiar in the minds of these people. Um, they're saying, well, how with modern weaponry could we possibly withstand that, right? Um, he spends like six years, seven years studying this question. He doesn't just produce a response to that question, though one of these volumes does discuss Warsaw as a case study. Instead, he says, actually, looking at all this data, it looks like war in any country amongst the sort of great powers, we'll talk a little bit about what that means, would be financially, economically, demographically, morally sort of ruinous. That's the overall argument of this book. So we have to find another way to settle territorial, political, other disputes. Um, one of the things I'm interested in as a scholar is, again, the sort of visual display of argumentation. And this book, uh, it's kind of like if you go into a digital um, book today, you can click on lots of pop-out graphics, things like that. Well, this is like the pre-digital version of that. I have a, one volume of this on that table over there, so I can show you some examples. There are all of these pull-out charts, these weirdly folded things that you pull out and you see these comparisons. Uh, one of the things that he's showing here, and we'll come back to this, is how has war changed over time? So he's got like black powder, and then a sort of more advanced type of gunpowder, and then the most advanced type of smokeless gunpowder. So how does that change artillery tactics when suddenly you're not swathed in smoke anymore? You can actually see your target as you continue firing. That was one of his interests. This shows the change in the way that people uh, were able to conceal themselves. And so if you've seen World War I movies, if you saw 1917 or other movies like this, you know, you, you've seen the trenches. That was sort of modern technology at this time. Before the late 19th century, people didn't entrench themselves in that way during war. So he thought this is also going to change the practicality of using war as a way to settle disputes. And he tried to show that. He's also got, you know, this is the accuracy of people shooting at targets with modern weaponry, right? This is a graphic for how do you blow up a bridge? You know, things that are happening today over in Ukraine though with very different types of munitions, right? At this time, already some of these modern features of warfare are, are in play. Now I wanna say something about what is the term that we in this human, sort of human rights world, but also in advocacy world would say about how did he think that showing certain things about what war was like would actually lead to change in the world? How does just, providing facts about warfare lead people to change their commitments about whether warfare is the right thing to do. So we call this in the sort of advocacy world, what was his theory of change? And although this graphic is not by him, I think this roughly corresponds to his theory of change. He had this thesis that in modern conditions, war couldn't possibly achieve its goals. Another way of putting that is it's impossible except at the price of suicide to carry out a war. How would that actually cause war to no longer be fought? Well, he thought, like many peace activists in the 19th century, first you change public opinion. So first you get people, just ordinary people, to change their views about whether we want to support our country going to war to achieve territorial, economic, other goals. That will trickle up to political leaders who will have to respond to public opinion. Ultimately, 
governments will work together to find other ways of settling their disputes. And you see the top of this, the, the last thing to happen on this graph is world peace. Now, unlike the British and the American peace activists that this graphic is directly about, Bloc was not living in a democratic system. So this kind of assumes political leaders have to respond for democratic reasons. They won't be elected, they won't succeed politically if they don't respond to public opinion. In his case, he thought, even in non-democratic systems, rulers like the Tsar of Russia need to be concerned about revolutions. And so even if they're not concerned about losing an election, if public opinion goes so far against war that they have to be worried, as we know in fact did happen in Russia a few decades later, that there will be a revolution, they'll, they'll find another way. And apparently, um, apparently, for reasons I'll explain shortly, Tsar Nicholas II was receptive to this idea, um, though it didn't end well. Now Bloch understood, this is sort of publicity, right? Publicity is the way you're going to go from facts about war to changes in politics. Well, he understood that six hefty volumes is not the way you change public opinion then <laughs> or now, right? So he sought out all the most sort of modern ways of spreading his message that existed in the late 19th century. There wasn't the internet, there weren't digital displays, you couldn't do the things like these touch screens back here, though he would have loved that for sure. He definitely would have done that if he could have. He was using the mass media of the day. So newspapers, he was giving interviews to journalists about his theory. He was publishing open letters to major peace activists. And then maybe the most modern thing, he was doing the 19th century version of what I'm doing now, standing next to a screen that has some images on it and talking about his thesis, right? In his case, it was either a, I believe they used um, sort of gas, the way gas lights worked. Um, maybe towards the very end of his life, he could have used electricity to use these sort of ma magic lantern devices to project onto a wall. And these are some sort of poor quality because these are the published versions in a book, images from his magic lantern slides. So this is like a submarine, which was relatively new military technology at the time coming out from under the water. These are the kinds of shells that can pierce a certain level of armor. This is sort of a statistical chart. And so he would talk to audiences very much like this now about this is what war looks like today. It's not like the kind of war that you grew up reading stories about. It's not like the Napoleonic Wars. It's not like the Revolutionary War. It's not even that much like the Civil War, although there were modern elements of that war. So you think that war is the way to achieve your goals. It's not gonna work. I said that he knew Tsar Nicholas II. Some people claim that Bloch was the reason why the Tsar called the Hague Peace Conference in 1899. Now, some of you may know this history. Hague Peace Conference was the first major international conference that produced a clear text, a treaty text of international humanitarian law. That sounds great. Humanitarian law is how do we make war less bad for the people who either as civilians suffer it or as soldiers fight it, right? So ruling out things like exploding bullets, ruling out things like deliberately targeting civilian sites. At the time, that was seen as kind of a compromise and a disappointment. That was seen as this was the sort of low-hanging fruit that they were able to achieve, but what they couldn't do was get disarmament. They couldn't get the European nations, the other great powers, which would have included Japan and the United States. They couldn't get them to agree not to arm themselves for war. They also couldn't get them to agree to what Bloc was really interested in, mandatory arbitration. So arbitration is when two nations have a dispute about territory, about a vessel that's been captured in a war. Do they go to war to fight it, to achieve that territory? No, they can go to a court and have a neutral arbitrator decide which party has the legal entitlement to the object of interest. He thought that that actually was the only feasible way of solving the problems that modern nations has, because remember, he thought war was not a feasible way. But they didn't manage to achieve mandatory arbitration at the Hague Peace Conference. They achieved voluntary arbitration. So there was an international court of arbitration that was created. It still exists in The Hague today. Um, but at the time, it was not required for nations to go to that court. And in fact, Russia, actually Ukraine, asked this court to evaluate Russia's claim of genocide in the disputed areas of Ukraine at the start of the war this past spring. Because they said, well, you don't go to war to settle that disputed claim. We have a court of arbitration to do it. Now, of course, he's sort of a publicist. He's also a sort of bon vivant. 
And so it's said that he provided free champagne, free flowers, lots of things at these lantern side lectures that he gave on the sidelines of the Hague Conference to bring people in. I didn't bring champagne, you know, maybe that would have brought dozens more of you in, but it's 11 o'clock a.m., his, his were evening events, right? Um, and these were very, very closed room negotiations. So he was not part of the official delegations, which were all men, right, from about 26 countries that could take part in this. So famous women peace activists, they could come to his lectures. Other people who were interested in peace could come to his lectures. He's known to have met Herzl at the Hague Conference, but I'm not sure if Herzl actually attended his lectures or they met on the sidelines. There were a number of future Nobel Peace Prize winners who were present at the Hague Conferences. Uh, some of you may know Bertha von Suttner. She's the first woman to win the Nobel Peace Prize. She wrote a famous novel that's sort of the Uncle Tom's Cabin of the international peace movement called uh, Lay Down Your Arms. He also met uh, Paul Destornelles de Constant. He was one of the first justices on the International Court of Arbitration, future Nobel Peace Prize winner. And so Bloch was kind of happy with what happened in The Hague, but he also thought I could go bigger, I could go better, I could do more than just show lantern slides. I could show them the actual tools of war today, because maybe what you have to do to see how war is different today is you have to see a sort of flintlock rifle from the revolutionary era and then you have to see a Maxim machine gun side by side and see this is not the same kind of thing. Some of the arguments we're hearing today about does our constitution that gives us the right to bear arms apply to an AR-15, right? Also the kind of comparison he was interested in. So he writes a prospectus for what was essentially, I don't even know, I guess the Olympic Games are the closest thing that we have today to these World Fairs and Expositions that cost massive amounts of money and bring people from all over the globe. <laughs> But these were not athletic competitions, though sometimes they coincided with the Olympics. These were sort of a trade show. It was like going to Disney World. There were all sorts of displays. Epcot is kind of like a version of this. Um, so people who study the sort of humanities love these things because they provide you with all sorts of interesting historical data about what was the most modern technology of the time, what were people's ideas like. And he published a prospectus saying, I should have a huge pavilion that would contain all of the stuff that I've been collecting about modern war. He wasn't successful. He didn't get a huge pavilion. He got to hang about 40 panels on the Swiss section of a sort of off the beaten path part of this exposition. So maybe the number of images that are on the wall here, roughly that number of things. And he had some stiff competition. So W.E.B. Du Bois had a very famous exposition at this Paris exposition, which was about the rise of blacks in America since emancipation in economic terms, in sort of agricultural terms, in educational terms. This is an image of Du Bois's exhibit. And you can sort of see the setup here. They're trying to cram as much as possible into a small area. So they have all of these little tables that you can fold back and forth. These are all books and newspapers published by African Americans in the United States. And Du Bois won a gold medal for this. And what's nice about the Du Bois exposition is unlike Bloch's materials, all of this was saved, or at least all of the panels that Du Bois created. So you can go on the Library of Congress's website and you can see all of these sort of charts that Du Bois created. It's helpful here, I think, because these are very much of the same kind as Bloch's materials. He was also using not sort of modern printing technology, but the sort of graphic arts of the time to create visual displays of information very similar to Du Bois's. Now, unfortunately, there's no record that they ever met. Du Bois writes a letter that gets published about just the building that his exposition is in, and he mentions some of the other things there. He doesn't mention Bloch's materials. There are pictures of Du Bois at the exposition. It's not clear to me, from my research, how long Bloch personally spent at the exposition. Did he just help design it like he designed the railroads, but he wasn't there on the ground actually building them, right? And in neither case was that the focus of the exposition. So this is a French company called Schneider. It has a sort of double barrel name that created naval vessels, armaments, things like that. You can see they've got an enormous pavilion. Bloch had like a tiny sort of hallway in the building next to it, right? <laughs> uh, the disproportion caused a friend of Bloch's who also eventually won the Nobel Prize, Albert Fried, to say it was like David and Goliath at the Paris Exposition. The armaments, the international war crowd completely outweighed the international peace crowd here. I'm coming to the end of the founder piece. Frustrated by that experience, aided by the folks, I remember I said he's put his stuff in the Swiss section of the exposition, so he met a lot of Swiss people, particularly people in the military. 
who helped him design some of his tables. Um, he began planning a permanent ex exhibition that would bring his arguments to a wider audience. And that was how the groundwork was laid for the museum, which unfortunately opened just about five months after he died of an aneurysm in January 1902. So a lot of the stuff was in place, a lot of the material was created, the site was chosen, the building was under construction, but he never actually got to see it in the works, which is kind of sad. This is a portrait from his obituary. So now I'm gonna to turn to the fixtures of the museum. What was the museum like? You've heard about the founder, you've heard a little bit about the peace movement of the time and what they thought was necessary to achieve a winning argument for peace instead of war. This is the exterior of the building. The first building, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how there were two buildings and why there were two buildings for this museum that had existed for 18 years. I'm gonna talk about its location a little bit, but I'm mostly gonna talk about what was inside it and how did people at the time respond to his exhibits. A first thing to say is, well, I talked about what an exposition was then. What was a museum like in the late 19th century? You've probably been to many museums in your lifetimes. Was a museum at the time the Block was building his actually very much like museums today? There's an American museum professional who worked at the Smithsonian. He died a few years before Block and that towards the end of his life, he wrote a pretty well-known lecture about museums and he said there were six kinds of museums. There are art museums, history museums, anthropology museums, uh, which are more common in Europe today, I think, than here. Museums of natural history, technology museums, maybe you've been to the Chicago Technology, Science and Technology Museum or the Great Lakes one up in Cleveland, and commercial museums. And I was tempted to say, well, Bloch's museum was the first five of these. But actually, I just recently discovered there's even an element of the sixth one. A commercial museum is sort of a company. It's like the Schneider Pavilion at the exposition where they're showing off their wares. Uh, there was a bit of a controversy when Bloch's museum opened because they're very famous arms manufacturer in Germany called Krupp that made cannons. And they said, hey, you could have a couple of our most modern cannons and put them on display for free at your museum. And the people who founded the museum, this happened after Block passed away, were like, yeah, okay, we'll do that. And so it was sort of free publicity for Krupp. So there's even a bit of the commercial museum there. So whatever, whatever Kevin says, you know, we should get some military hardware in this museum. I think of that anecdote from now on, right? Yeah, we'll partner with uh, North of Grumman or somebody. So let's look at the plan of the museum. Let's see what was there. It's a much bigger space than this one. I believe it was a little bit longer than a football field and a, almost as wide as a football field. So a very big space compared to this space. Uh, first, where was Lucerne? Uh, this was Andy's suggestion. Show people on a map where Lucerne is. Okay, this is a, this is a 19th century map. Uh, Switzerland is sort of this mountainous region here. Block is from Poland. He wouldn't have taken this route, you know, the grand tour sort of route for wealthy tourists at the time. Maybe you're coming from London, say, so you go through Belgium, you go to Paris, you keep going down, maybe you go over to the Rhine, you go down the Rhine, you're going to go to Italy. So how do you get to Italy? Well, maybe you pass from Paris or Germany through Switzerland. Lucerne was like a tourist stop town on that route, right? It got about 140,000 visitors a year to the town for a town that was 30,000 people. So it had a significant tourist traffic compared to its population. And they were at the time looking for, how can we make people not just come here, spend the night and then get on the next train and leave, but how can we make them actually spend some time here, spend some money here, right? So there was a reason why they wanted this museum to be located there. They gave them free ground rent on this building and they allowed them to use a pre-existing festival building, the one that I showed you a picture of, they said, okay, for five years, you could use this for free. That was pretty attractive to the people founding the museum. I'm happy to answer sort of economic questions about the museum if you have not afterwards, but I don't think that's the most interesting piece. Here's a plan, and this plan comes from a few years after the initial opening, because you'll see here uh, the Russo-Japanese War, 1904 to 1905. That hadn't happened yet when it first opened its doors, so that they had to add a gallery of that. But this is the plan of the museum. Look at where the number one is there. That's the biggest space in this museum. I'm gonna show you two pictures of what was in that space. That was the armory. So here's a first picture that shows you close up. They had a lot of cannons. Uh, they're in sort of historical order, though I'm not enough of a military historian to tell you. So I think these are the oldest kinds of cannons. Maybe these are made of copper. 
And then the more recent sort of field artillery guns are back there. And there's a wonderful chart, which is not in this picture, showing that the most modern ones, the Krupp ones that they're showing off, they could shoot as high a trajectory that would go over Mont Blanc. So they have a painting of Mont Blanc, a major mountain, right? And then they show the trajectory of a projectile going over it, right? Now this room was said to completely dwarf the people who went into it. And so there's another picture that's very grainy that sort of shows that. So here you can see some people standing here. And you can see how many guns and cannons there are in here, um, how high the roof is to this building. And you see it extends over here as well. So it's a really big space. Now he also wanted to tell a historical story about how his warfare changed, not just from the early 19th century to today, but from the oldest recorded history of humanity to today. So you go from that big cannon-filled room to a room that shows you ancient weaponry. And how are the ancient things that were closest to our modern cannons different from modern cannons? So he has some replicas of Roman warfare. Uh, one of these is called a ballista, one is called a catapult, one shoots sort of a big arrow, one is for hurling rocks, but they're very similar. They're kind of the artillery of that time. Um, and there's a quote from the guidebook to the museum. I have a copy over there, and this is German in that guidebook, but it says, well, as war developed between peoples, people were like, okay, there's a sort of defensive, offensive arms race, right? And so they're tracing a history of the two sides of this question. And so the defensive side, they're like, okay, let's put up some walls and actually defend ourselves against the people who might come in and try to kill us. And so once they do that, you can't just use your ordinary weapons, so you need these kinds of weapons that can breach walls. That continues in the sort of Middle Age section where there are models of walled towns from the Middle Ages. Um, this was based in Switzerland, I told you. A lot of the army officers who helped prepare the exhibits of the museum were Swiss army officers. And so some of the reviews of the time point out, okay, there's like 40 things in the medieval warfare section and 36 of them are like Swiss history things. <laughs> not surprising, but not necessarily an accurate picture of the most important wars in human history or European history. Um, there were a lot of paintings, and some of these are hard to trace, you know, who the artists were. I'll show you a couple examples where we do know who the artists are. And then there were these charts. This is probably the closest to the kind of thing that was at the Paris Exposition. So it's got a sort of Beaux-Arts design. It's got this nice oak leaf decoration here. It has an obvious sort of iconography of the Grim Reaper, right, which you'll see in other artwork that I'll show you. What does it actually say? So this one is in French and German. He didn't include English on this one, but he would on a lot of the museum exhibits. Uh, this says the number of fatalities suffered by the different German lands, different German military forces during the Franco-Russian War, or Franco-Prussian War. That's that war of 1870, 1871, where I told you Paris was put under siege. So he's saying even the victors, the enormous victors, surprisingly easy victory of Germany or Prussia in that war, this is the number of fatalities that they suffered. And he's going through Württemberg, Baden, Prussen, Bayern, Hessen. The number here is 940,897. So even the winning side in this relatively short war where there was a sort of massive victory by Germany lost almost a million men. And remember, Germany today has you know, something around 80 million people. You know, that's probably maybe a third of that at most at this time, right? So that's a huge number of people to lose. And those are, I believe these are supposed to be fatalities rather than just casualties, right? Now again, he didn't think that charts like this, although he thought the statistics were important, he basically thought every way you could convince people that war is becoming more and more deadly, you should use. So he has here, and this was commented at the time as well, uh, they took a horse, I suppose a dead horse, I hope, and they shot it with different kinds of weapons from different eras at different ranges to show how much damage different kinds of bullets shot from different ranges would do to this horse skeleton. Um, and I don't want to make too much of the sort of macabre features of this museum, which really wasn't a sort of gruesome. It wasn't like the torture museum or something like that. But it had some macabre things. And I, I also just recently learned there's some human skulls in that vitrine. I didn't know much about this. You know, where do these come from? There was a war in Switzerland where there was a famous battle uh, called Danach in 1499. There was a catacomb that was built with an ossuary for the bones of all the people who died on the battlefield. And they had had like the 400th anniversary of that battle just before this museum opened. So they must have had these human remains displayed in some way. 
So I guess somebody at the museum is like, oh, we should show those skulls from the people who died in that war to see what sort of head wound from the kind of weapons they had at that time was like compared to modern weaponry. So that's, again, it's kind of grisly. And maybe this was a very attractive feature of the museum for people going in there. I don't know. It is ethical questions about should you try to, sort of, in a grisly way, convince people not to commit war. But the most modern thing that he had, other than those lantern slides, this was all the rage at the time. This was like going to the IMAX theater at the Great Lakes Science Center, were these dioramas. And he hired, you know, it's not, not the artists who are famous today as sort of painters and sculptors are the sort of high arts. But these were the sort of most famous popular arts people. These were the people who designed stage sets, who built these big panoramas. Um, they were like the people who do the graphics for movies today, I suppose, right? Who don't get the same respect as sort of the high <laughs> arts do. This is a picture that shows you how they actually created these dioramas. So this is the painter and an assistant, and they've got this big platform that they use to paint a really tall picture of a machine gun nest up in the mountains somewhere in Switzerland. Machine guns being like the modern form of military technology at the time. This one was not a sort of before and after but a lot of the dioramas, I think there were 10 dioramas in this museum when it opened, a lot of them were showing what it was like then, what it's like now. And here's an example. On the left, that diorama shows, this is what artillery fire was like when we had this really heavy smoke gunpowder that we used. Um, you know, they couldn't really see what they're shooting at. The people trying to hit them really can't see them very well. And so it's all a bit of a shambles. This is with the uh, smokeless powder. So you see a person here, with a pair of field glasses saying, oh, are our shells actually hitting the target or not? And you see this horse running away because, oh, they can also see us really well from over there, and so they can target us directly. And this was sort of very much part of the story of World War I just a decade and a half later. Okay, so those are the contents of the first building. Um, the building, you can see the bones of it here, although it looks very medieval, it was not a solid rock structure. It was sort of like a theater set design. It was this wooden frame. So they knew they couldn't use it forever. It was drafty. It was cold for much of the year. The, the stuff would get leaked on. So they needed to build a new building. Does that sound familiar? We need a new building for our museum? Yes. Now they built a new purpose-built structure for their museum. It's the one that was on the flyer for this talk. It's in a different part of the city. It's a little bit further from the main railroad station. The first museum, one of the best things about it is right by the place where the tourists arrive into Lucerne. So they could see it coming out of the train station. This one's further away. It's up against the wall of the city. So it has that sort of defensive structure, but it's not there. And you see here the three languages, German, French, and English. One of my favorite details about this, you see, okay, to enter the museum is one franc, but to take pictures with your Kodak in the museum is three francs. It's a smaller museum and it has a completely different layout. It also has a beautiful sort of Art Nouveau decoration to it, so it's not this neo-Gothic style. And it was said at the time, it's great that it's smaller because you don't get that sort of exhausted museum feeling that you sometimes get when you go to the Met or to the British Museum, right? So you can see there's far fewer cannons in here. Notice the decorative work here. Um, but there really wasn't that much different in contents. The plan was similar. The peace activists at the time thought that was a bad thing. They thought, okay, the first museum gave too much preeminence to war instead of peace, and this one is doing the same thing. We really should have had a complete overhaul of the program of this museum. We didn't do that. Um, I wanted to show some of the paintings, and I have copies of postcards with these paintings. Unfortunately, these particular paintings, they've all gone missing. These are no longer publicly available anywhere, and it's not even clear they still exist because it's not clear who, if anybody, bought these after the museum closed. But they're all by the same painter, a Dutch painter named Jan ten Kate. He painted these sort of allegorical scenes. Um, so this is an angel smashing a cannon. That's peace among men. This is war against war. So you see, again, the Grim Reaper iconography. And then these are sort of identifiable people here. So here's Bertha von Suttner. There's other identifiable people there. And then this is after the war. So when the two sides have suffered all their losses and they're making a sort of sacrifice, they've both been crucified on the cross of war, right? And you can see how these were hung in the peace room at this museum. So the first two are the top two on the left there. And the third one is, well, it's a bit hard to tell. It's that one on that side of the museum. And they have sort of portraits of famous peace activists, people who won the Nobel Peace Prize on the wall here. 
So now I'm coming to the last part of the talk. I'll go rather quickly here, I think. This is the fate of the museum. What happened? The sort of historical events that happened, and then there's also um, changes in how people thought about peace that were some of the reasons why this museum doesn't exist anymore. So immediately after it opens, you know, Bloch's thesis was a war between great powers is impossible because it would be impossibly costly for both of the nations involved. Well, there's a war between great powers, Japan and Russia, that happens like two years after. And although there was an uprising in Russia, it was a sort of failed uprising, so it wasn't the revolution that ends the Russian Empire, um, it appears that a war could be fought between great powers. So some people criticize Bloch's thesis on the basis of this conflict. You'll see in this painting, these are some of the modern hospital techniques, field hospital techniques that he described in his book as, okay, water war is becoming much more deadly in part because people can continue to fight because they get treated on the site of their wounds, right? In the United States, he's criticized by the brother of the inventor of the Maxim machine gun, so not an unbiased party, <laughs> but he's referred to by name as a false prophet of peace by the brother of this guy who himself also made gunpowder, so also an arms dealer, essentially. And he's using what I find interesting, some of the same infographics that Bloch used in his book for peace to try to make an argument for arming for war. And this gets republished at the beginning of the First World War before we're in that war. But of course, it is the First World War that is the biggest test for Bloch's thesis and for the Peace Museum as a whole. So on the one hand, people say, okay, his claims about how modern warfare would be really inert and really deadly for everybody involved were completely borne out by World War I. You know, he was showing things like modern entrenchment. And he was doing things like saying it's hard for you to actually consolidate territorial gains, and that's exactly what happens on the Western Front in World War I. So in that way, he's sort of proven right. He predicted the next big European war, there'd be 10 million men who would bear arms in that war. Actual statistics from World War I, there were 10 million soldiers roughly killed. There were at least 20 million people who bore arms through the course of the conflict, though there were new people coming in and some people were leaving at different points in time. So he was not off by an order of magnitude there. Um, so his thesis is maybe vindicated by World War I, but unfortunately the museum itself is ruined by World War I. Uh, it liquidated its assets just a couple months after the Treaty of Versailles. And there's a, a piece of the fate is what happened to the things in the museum. Well, some of those were given back to the places that had loaned them to the museum. Some of them were auctioned off. Some of them were donated to other museums. But most of these, I think, 4,000 plus museum exhibits have just been completely lost, which is quite sad. Um, and there's a guy over in the UK associated with the Bradford Peace Museum who's been really generous to me in preparing some of this talk. He has argued there's basically three reasons why the museum in Lucerne doesn't survive World War I by more than a year. Uh, first, during the war, it was almost impossible to get to Switzerland from the main tourist routes where you would have done so. So even though Swiss, Switzerland is neutral, you still can't get there to visit the museum. And that dealt a real blow to revenues. The high point of attendance at the museum was something like 70,000 people in a year. And during the World War I era, it's like less than 5,000. So they just don't make the revenues they need to stay open. A second piece was, well, he was trying to create a sort of experiential museum where you could sort of see the guns and see what they would do. And well, now millions of people in Europe have direct experience of this, so they don't really need to go to a museum to experience modern warfare. And then there's this third piece where peace itself gets a negative connotation amongst a lot of people, especially in the Austrian and German sort of regions that were one of the key bastions for this museum. Now, Everybody's angry because they think they've been unjustly given all of the blame for World War I by the peace conference, and so peace itself has a bad name amongst them. So those are Peter's analysis. And I think that's, as far as I know, basically right. He's a far more eminent historian of this museum than I am. Just in conclusion, what are, how did the physical sites and the ideas continue after Bloch? Um, the first museum site, this is my second favorite thing, besides those smear novels, uh, <laughs> It became a roller rink for a certain time. <laughs> this is an image of the interior of the roller rink. So that big space with all the cannons is now a roller rink. And it's still a sort of site for cultural meetings. So this is like a multi-billion dollar art museum concert space. You see this giant yacht next to it. So it's still where the wealthy travelers of Europe might come for a visit to Lucerne. 
The second building is still standing. I hope to go to Lucerne this summer. I'm not sure if it's going to happen, but I, I might be able to actually see this building, which is now part of the sort of academic high school in the city. And because of its design on the inside, it was so nicely done because it was purpose built as a museum. For a time, the city used it as an art museum. So this is the same space from that second museum. Now, Bloch's ideas, what were his ideas that continue? Well, first he thought if you could show people the before and after of war, that would be a powerful way of committing them to being against war. And that's something that's continued. So there's many images I could show, but this is just from a Ukrainian child in the past few months showing a sort of before and after. This is what my house was like before. This is what it's like. So this is sort of a convention of representing war that even very young children understand and can use. He was also concerned with the economic costs of war, and that is an interest that continues. So there's a project at Brown University called the Costs of War Project, where they're trying to estimate what is the cost of our wars in Iraq and Afghanistan after 9-11. And the estimate from last year, I'm sure this is probably higher now, is $8 trillion total for a country, I think our GDP is something like 13 or $14 trillion a year, so almost a full year of total economic output, economic costs for that war. Now, I don't know whether we have much time for discussion, but just putting some things on the table. You know, there are things I'd like to say about how this piece museum relates to the Block Museum, and there are some questions about are the purposes that we're trying to serve exactly the same? Are they broader? Are they narrower in some ways? Um, so there's a first question. Do modern wars, like our war in Iraq or the current war in Ukraine, do they fit Block's thesis? Is his basic intellectual architecture for his museum adequate to thinking about wars today? So that's the first question. I'm not going to try to answer these, it's just raising them. Second, how do the problems of peace that we face today in Dayton differ from those that faced visitors to Lucerne 12 decades ago? Lucerne, a town of 30,000 people, not 140,000 plus the metropolitan area, uh, a country that was far less racially, ethnically, religiously diverse than our city and nation today. And then third, and I'm interested in this as well, what techniques and technologies can we use for peace education today uh, that Bloch couldn't employ because they didn't exist? And you know, what difference do they actually make to our programming? And I'll just close by saying uh, several people gave me a lot of help with this. I want to thank them for that. And thank you, for you to all of you for being here. Thank you so much for joining me for this installment of the Peace Builders series at the Dayton International Peace Museum. I hope that you'll come visit us at our new location on Courthouse Square in Dayton, Ohio, and hope to see you next time. Take care. <laughs>